Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Friday's Live. It's that time of the week where we kick back, relax and talk about all things family history. Does anybody else do a little bit of a dance to the intro music? Daisy, did you do a dance? <laughs> Just a little one. <laughs> Just a little jiggle. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Ellie. I'm Senior Community Executive at Family Past. And this week, I'm absolutely delighted to announce in her Friday's Live and Family Past from Home debut... Daisy Goddard is co-hosting with me today. Hello, Daisy. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's really nice to be um, doing this for you today. Um, yeah, for those of you that don't know me, um, my name's Daisy, um, and I'm a copywriter um, and researcher um, in the same team as Ellie here at Find My Past. Um, yeah, you might recognise my name if you read the um, weekly um, record release blogs. Um, I've been taking those over since Jessie left, um, so you might recognise my name from there um yeah I'm really looking forward to getting into the records with you um yeah and seeing what we can seeing what we can find I'm absolutely delighted to have you here as are so many of our regular viewers we've got lots of you here already today uh we can see Gillian hello from Edinburgh it's a bit bleak here in Edinburgh today I uh, would much rather it be nice and sunny uh we've got Janet joining from my native North Wales hello uh, Andrew saying it's overcast in Lancashire with short showers. Yes, we're getting some of those too. Roz joining us from Massachusetts. It's sunny there. I'm so jealous. I would love a bit of sun. <laughs> it's also really rainy here in London as well. <laughs> really rainy. Yeah. Daphne says it's lashing it down in Somerset. So we need to make sure that we speak at a good volume and enunciate <laughs> to make sure she can hear us over the rain. Um, Bev joining us from Norwich. Hello. So many of you here. It's so lovely to see. Um, if you are joining us for the first time, please do introduce yourself. Tell us where you're joining. Tell us where you're joining from today, what the weather's like with you, maybe a little bit about you and your family history, anything like that. Yes, don't get. It's all right, Anya. I've, uh, I've blocked two spammers already. Um, let me know if you spot any more and we will block them and get rid of them because we don't want those in with us today, do we? <laughs> No. Uh, we've got Kathy joining us from New Jersey. Hello. Uh, Barbara joining us from Ontario in Canada. Also in the rain. I would much rather be over in Canada, though. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> uh, and we've got Jenny from Western Australia. Anne joining us from Knoxville. Goodness, we really do have a, uh, a very global audience today, which is so yeah. lovely to see. Fantastic. Before we get started today, there's just a few uh, housekeeping bits. So later on in April, I am going to be joined by Jessamy Carlson, who is the Family History Engagement Lead at the National Archives in Kew. And she's joined us before as a guest on Family of Past from Home. But last time she did a, a session answering your questions about family history. And she said to me afterwards, Ellie, I would really like to take some of your community's brick walls and um, have a go at tackling some of them. So what I've asked on our Facebook page uh, today, yesterday, it might have been yesterday, I've asked for your brick walls. And if you'd like to go find that, comment with your brick wall. We'll pick a few. And then what we're going to do for a session in April is we'll take a few of those brick walls. We're not going to necessarily desperately try and solve them for you. If we can, we will. But really, it's going to be about the methodology behind it, how we found what we found, not just this is what we found. So, yeah, go and go and add your brick walls just so we've got lots to choose from. And even if we don't do yours this time, we might do it another time. So, um, yeah, keep those uh, keep those coming in. And then in terms of what we're, what we're going to do today, what the plan is, uh, Daisy's going to do a whistle-stop tour of our new records and newspapers, aren't you, Daisy? Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we're, yeah. We're going to do question of the week. I'll just pop it on screen for you. Daisy, you've chosen this week's question of the week, haven't you? Yes, yeah. I think um, Ellie is very pleased to have me uh, joining and helping with the question of the week, given that she has to um, kind of come up with something new every single week um, and continually try and find new challenges. Um, yeah, so I, I um, came up with this one. Um, so this week, uh, the question that I thought we could um, chat about and what we could kind of hear your answers on um, is what were your ancestors doing in 1939? So this is partly, you'll, you'll kind of get the theme when I come on to the new records <laughs> for this week. Um, yeah, I won't give any more away. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're going to do new records, question of the week. And then to finish up, I have combined 
a case study for you um, showcasing a record collection we've already got on Farmer Past and I absolutely love. And if you've not looked at it yet, I would heartily recommend you take a look. And it also so it combines that with a tutorial. So I've sort of put them both together, also dubbed Ellie fell down the rabbit hole again because let's be honest I do this every week so yeah that's what we're going to do today um let's just have a quick look in the comments again before we move on to new records uh Crystal says this is such a lovely idea I have commented and I'm hoping I can join even if mine isn't reviewed I might learn something thank you for the opportunity you are more than welcome this is what I mean when I say that Jessamy and I really want to tackle the methodology and the how rather than just the this is what we found um so yeah even if we don't pick your brick wall and it's absolutely nothing personal if we don't <laughs> i'm i'm hoping everybody will learn something so yes there we go um on you saying can we send no can jen send some sunshine our oh, way yes jen please do send us some sunshine <laughs> yes please <laughs> <laughs> i would like that a lot well okay it's... that I was just going to say, so Gordon, you said minus seven, minus seven degrees Celsius in Calgary today. It's not quite that bad in London. It's grey and dreary, but it is, um, it's about 12, 13 degrees. So I maybe can't complain too much. It's not as bad as that. <laughs> okay, shall we dive right in, Daisy? Over to you for new records. Yes. So what's new this week? Uh, so... Uh, this week, uh, we've got additions to two record sets, uh, so the 1939 Register and our Sussex Burial Records. So we've also added six new newspaper, newspaper titles to our collection, um, and we've also updated 96 of our existing titles. So a big, a big week for newspapers this week. So firstly, then, let's have a little look at what we've added to the 1939 Register. So we've added uh, 90,809 records. Uh, this week so this contains transcripts and the original images so we can see um, I'm sure you all know what the transcripts um, from the 1939 register look like um, like this one on on the screen here um, but we'll come on to have a little look at some original records in a sec so yeah as I'm sure a lot of you already know um, these records in the 1939 register um, are under the 100 year rule uh, which means that the records are closed for 100 years um, from a person's birth date um, or until that person is registered as deceased. So, um, of course, this means that every month um, more records can be um, made public um, because it hits 100 years since somebody was born. Um, so with this release, um, a lot of the records that we've got are people that were born um, in, the late, in late 1922 and the early months of 1923. Uh, and there are also, also some others um, that weren't born this month that are kind of that have been born prior to that. So, uh, yeah, so as Ellie uh, mentioned last week, when she was kind of going a bit more in depth um, on the 1939 register, um, these records are really uh, rich in detail. Um, this is because the register was undertaken um, quite urgently as a way of cataloguing um, the civilian population um, at the outbreak of World War II. So as an example, so here is the record um, of Daisy Goddard, um, whose maiden name was Scrivener, and this is actually my great grandmother, um, and this was my namesake, it's who I'm named after. Um, so we can see her address um, on here. So she lived at uh, 46 Russell Road in Wimbledon, um, and she worked as a cook. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, here's the original record. Uh, so we can see that Daisy uh, was living with Harry Edward Goddard, which is my great grandfather. Um, and he worked as an account representative furnisher. Uh, so we can just see like how much how much detail um, how much detail we can find within these records, um, and how it really provides us that little glimpse into what our ancestors were up to. So um, yeah, so this week I did a little bit of digging into the new records specifically, um, and found a few interesting people um, who I'm kind of going to tell you about. So if we want to move on to the next slide, so. The first of these um, is Terence Alexander. So you might recognize him um, as the actor who played Charlie Hungerford um, in Bergerac, um, the TV show that ran in the 80s and 90s, I think. <laughs> Correct me on that um, if that's wrong. Um, so he was born on the 11th of March, 1923. Um, so his address, uh, it's his address in 1939 um, when he's age 16. Um, is at a public assistance institution in Yorkshire. Now, I wasn't sure um, whether this was 
um, maybe showing us that his family had like fallen on hard times and that they were impoverished and that they were maybe inmates in a workhouse. Um, but if we look above his entry and we look at his parents, that kind of tells us all we need to know. So his parents, Patricia and Joseph, um, were actually master and matron of this workhouse, um, which also did have an infirmary attached to it. So this explains uh, why some people living there uh, were listed as patients with P um, as the code and some are inmates. So it's I. Um, so, yeah, so Terence's parents um, both have O next to their name because they were officers um, as, the as the matron and the master of this, um, of this institution. So that is why he's listed um, at Knaresborough in, in Yorkshire. Uh, yeah, so the family, the whole family listed um, this workhouse on Stockwell Road as their place of residence, which I thought was an interesting, interesting thing to come across. So if we move on to somebody else then that I found, um, another notable person um, is Joy Lofthouse. So uh, she was a female pilot um, who worked with the Air Transport Auxiliary during World War II, um, and she was one of the Spitfire girls. So her story um, I found really interesting. Um, and I'd recommend you kind of go away and maybe do a little, do a little digging of your own because, yeah, it's a really interesting story. Um, basically, she signed up. Um, yeah, she signed up to the Air Force um, after seeing a magazine ad with her sister. Um, and even though she'd never driven a car before, she was one of 17 people out of 2000 applicants um, that were accepted onto the training program, which I thought was really, really amazing. Um, and it shows just what a, like what a natural talent <laughs> she clearly had for this. Um, so in 1939, um, at the outbreak of war, she was 16, obviously, as well. Um, and we can see her record here uh, with her maiden name on it um, and her full name, which is Joyce. Uh, so she's one of three daughters um, and her father's occupation um, is a rabbit trapper, uh, which I thought was really interesting. I don't know if you guys have um, come across that um, occupation before, <laughs> but um, yeah, rabbit trapper. I thought that was really that was really fun. I don't know how many rabbit trappers um, we'd have <laughs> with today's kind of census, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so that is everything for the 1939 census. Uh, so next up, we've also added to our Sussex burials set. Oh yeah, sorry, so that's just some photos that I thought I'd put in um, of, uh, yeah, of Joy Lofthouse. Um, we can, yeah, see her there with her, uh, yeah, with her team. Uh, yeah, great. So... Next then, um, the Sussex burials update. So we've added um, 46,567 new records to this set um, and their transcriptions, uh, which cover the Worthing local authority area uh, for the, between the years 1850 and 2012. Um, so specifically two cemeteries um, in Worthing, uh, the Broadwater Cemetery and the Durrington Cemetery. So, <laughs> Yeah, so in addition to the primary name search um, with, with this set, you can you can also, oh yeah, so I don't know if you want to go on to the next slide, maybe, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so as well, as well as obviously searching by name, which is the one you'll be most using, um, you can also uh, input the birth year, the burial year, uh, the death year, and the place. Uh, and you can also put keywords in. Uh, yeah, so these records contain um, the name, the birth year, the age at death, the burial date, and church dedication. Uh, and some records also do contain some extra notes um, with things like titles, places of residence, occupations, uh, relative names, uh, marital status, and also whether or not they'd come from a workhouse or were in a workhouse at the time of their death. So one record that I found uh, interesting from this set uh, was the record of Robert Henry Keeble, uh, who you can see here. So he was a local reverend um, and he died in 1931. So as you can see here, he hasn't got a birth date listed. Um, and this is true of a lot of the older records. Um, but if, um, if you're researching somebody that died a little bit later um, from kind of the 1980s and 90s to the current day, um, you'll typically find that birth date listed, but maybe not so, not so in these earlier ones. So yeah, so I kind of did a little bit of digging um, into him, into Robert, and we can find um, a report um, on his funeral service uh, in our newspaper collection. So this is the Worthing Herald on the right there um, from the 12th of December, 1931. So we can see some information here. Um, yeah, about his, about his funeral service. Uh, yeah, so although we also don't have his birthday, uh, we do have a lot of useful grave information included on his record. Um, 
So we can see the section, row and grave number, um, as well as the exact address of the cemetery itself. Um, this is something I thought was interesting about this set is that for both uh, of the Worthing cemeteries, there's a link to the map of the layout um, within the record transcript. So you can see exactly where someone's buried on the map. I think if we go on to the next slide, you'll be able to see an example of this. So forgot about yeah. the arrow. <laughs> oh yeah, my arrow that I put in, don't worry. <laughs> I, think, um, I think everyone knows where to look, so don't worry. Um, yeah, I thought this was really interesting. So you can get a really, um, a really kind of detailed picture of exactly where, uh, where the person you're researching is buried. Um, which is great if you'd want to um, maybe go and visit the grave site or do do further research into that. Uh, yes, so that is that's all for the records. Before we move on to newspapers, any any thoughts on this, Ellie? I think uh, yeah, I think that's that's everything we've added. Obviously, a lot lot of information there. <laughs> yeah, what I quite like about the 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 record that we looked at for the reverend uh, you know as you said there's no there's no year of birth recorded um which is fine but every record's a clue right so you were able to take that and go and find him in the newspapers and get more details which then could lead to more details and yes down the rabbit hole we all go um <laughs> out of uh, j just just to say um I had to, I had to, where's this comment gone? Uh, Sally says, uh, you know that trick you told us about putting the occupations in? Yes, we were doing this. <laughs> we were doing this last <laughs> week. Uh, there were 18 rabbit trappers in the 1939 register. There you oh. go. So that's really interesting. Thank you. So I didn't even think to, um, to, to do that search, but that's a really good idea. We are terrible influences. Anya says, with all the rabbit holes we end up going down, does this mean farmer past our <laughs> rabbit trappers? Uh, and then I particularly like Linda's comment, more like rabbit enablers. <laughs> <laughs> just, just go and explore <laughs> records. It's just fun, even if they're not for your own family. It's yeah. just fun to while away a couple of hours doing things That's like true. this. If you go down a rabbit hole, but you don't find the answer that you're looking for, I don't know if you can be counted as a rabbit catcher, right? <laughs> a rabbit chaser. <laughs> you've, not, you've not caught anything, have you? you, just, you just <laughs> and Jen says, I've never met a map I didn't like. That sounds like a challenge. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find one that you don't like. I'm maybe. sure we can find a, a really, really uh, dull map for you. <laughs> yeah, one that's just like really maybe like badly bad proportions or something like that I, I don't know we'll, we'll, we'll think about it <laughs> um lovely should we do newspapers yes so so this week then uh we added uh 675,584 new pages to our newspaper collection so uh, among these there are six new titles so these are uh the Daily Mortar Chronicle and Garris Garrison Gazette. I think they might be on the next slide, actually, if we wanted to. There might be a full list. Of, uh, oh, sorry, they're not. I lied. <laughs> I'll, read, I'll read these out. Sorry, that's my fault. Um, yeah, the Daily Mortar Chronicle and Garrison Gazette. Uh, the Egham and Staines News. The Essex and Hertz Mercury. The Hammersmith and Chiswick Leader. The New Adlington Advertiser. And the Newquay Express and Cornwall County Chronicle. So something that I found particularly interesting um, out of this list of new uh, new newspapers is the is the Malta title, the Daily Malta Chronicle and Garrison Gazette, um, because this is our first ever uh, paper from Malta. Um, and it's actually our second ever European title. I think we already have one for Gibraltar that came out a few weeks ago. Um, yeah. So this this paper was established in 1884 um, specifically for British servicemen that were stationed in Malta, um, which at the time uh, was part of the British Empire. So, uh, yeah, just as like a little bit of context, Malta had become part of the British Empire in 1814 um, after the Treaty of Paris. Um, and it became a very important military hub uh, in the Mediterranean for the British. Um, and it also was part of the route to India after the Suez Canal opened. Um, yeah, it played important roles in World War One and World War II um, as the site of lots of military hospitals um, and also a Navy base. So this paper, um, yeah, each title, each, um, sorry, each edition of this paper has eight pages. Um, it features things like telegrams, weather reports, um, birth, marriage and death notices, um, and also just general news uh, from Malta, but from the wider British Empire. 
uh, yeah, so it just gives us a really nice insight into the lives of British uh, military personnel that were stationed in Malta at the turn of the century. Uh, I thought, yeah, one standout edition of this paper is a special one that was published on the 6th of June, uh, 1897, uh, to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. Um, and because it was a special edition, um, it was actually printed on silk. Um, and as you can see here, it was illustrated uh, kind of very ornately. So this gives us a lot of detail about how the Jubilee was celebrated. Um, I can, I'll can i share the link to this in a second so you can have a little look for yourself. Um, but the celebration um, included bicycle races, live bands, um, religious ceremonies, and um, the reading of a telegram from the Queen herself. So I found this postcard. I did a little bit of digging to kind of find out what these celebrations might have looked like. Um, and I found, uh, yeah, this postcard just online of the celebrations um, in the capital of Malta, which is Valletta. So we can see here, like, how, um, how, how grand the scale is of these celebrations. Uh, and if we go on to the next one, from this same collection, actually, it's the personal collection um, of a Malte Maltese person called Giovanni Bonello. Um, this is of Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953. Um, I thought, given that we've like got our own <laughs> new coronation coming up in a few months, um, I thought it was kind of just interesting to add that in. Um, I also think Malta just looks very beautiful. I've not been to Malta, but um, yeah, I thought that looked amazing. Um, yeah, so if we want to go on to the next slide, this is onto our updated titles. Um, so yeah, 96 updated titles. So I couldn't fit everything onto a slide um, and I'm not going to read them all out, sorry. Um, but um, yeah, I'll kind of go into some of the main updates. Um, so the biggest update is to the Lincolnshire Free Press, um, which we've added uh, 67,000 pages to. And this is for intermittent years between 1871 and 1999. Um, so there's a massive date range there that we can explore. Um, other big updates uh, were to the Buckinghamshire Advertiser, uh, the Bristol Times and Mirror, and the Warsaw Observer as well. Uh, we've also added uh, added pages to seven of our Scottish titles, uh, including the Clyde Weekly News and the Wishaw World. Wishaw, sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Right. <laughs> um, and eight Welsh titles, um, including the Wales on Sunday, uh, the South Wales Daily Post, and the Vale Advertiser too. So overall, uh, yeah, there's been like a really good mix of new and old pages added this week. So from 19th century Malta to Lincolnshire, um, in the kind of more modern day. Um, there's obviously just like lots, lots of range here. So really, whatever, whatever you're kind of wanting to research and whatever you're interested in, um, there's definitely, definitely some pages here for you. Um, yeah, <laughs> lots added. I think that is all for the new records this week. Thank you so much, Daisy. That's yeah, we've there's a lot, there's a lot to dig your teeth into this week. Um, and I've seen lots of questions coming in about um, potential new newspapers that we could get in the future. So uh, Georgia says, can we get the Hackney Gazette from the 1950s? We will certainly ask the team if that's something that we could, uh, we could scan for you. And I think I saw another suggestion as well. Um, Crystal asking for the World's Fair, or will this only be available by the National Fairground Archives in Sheffield? If we have permission to publish, to scan and publish it, we'll scan and publish it. So again, this is one we'll pass on to our newspaper team for you. Cool. Shall we do question of the week? Yeah, let's do it. I think you did a nice slide for it. So we'll do that. We'll pop, pop the slides on. And um, uh, over to you for question of the week, if you fancy. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, let's ha I'll have a little look through these comments that we've already got. Bear with me for a second. I'm still um, still very much getting used to how to do the <laughs> how to do these lives. Um, but yeah, so just to repeat, so the question of the week: um, What were your ancestors doing in 1939? Um, so as we all know, uh, yeah, the 1939 register is a really really rich record set. And it gives us a really, really good insight and a lot of detail. Um, so, yeah, it's great to hear about everything that you've found out um, from this register, but also just from other sources as well. So if we go back, so let's put this on the screen. There we go. <laughs> so Daphne, uh, mum was at school at Bexhill on Sea and dad was an apprentice at Norwich. Great finds. What else have we got here? So uh, Kim, so all four grandparents in the 1939 register uh, they were, yeah, so, so all four grandparents were in the 1939 register. So warehouseman, quarry worker, shoddy worker, unpaid domestic duties, 
the four had great grandparents. Gas stacker, retired, unpaid domestic duties. Interesting. So warehouse quarry worker, we can see it's like very um, just working class uh, roots, clearly. Um, a lot of hard workers. I think that's a similar kind of case in, in my family. There's a lot of um, ma like manual labor um, kind of, yeah, in 1939. Mine as well, actually, um, although some of mine I haven't yet been able to find. Um, <laughs> my One of my great grandfathers was a, like a heavy, he was working as like a heavy unloader for Cadbury in 1939, having been a chemist for Cadbury uh, a few decades earlier. And, uh, and then I think I had some, one worked at uh, some sort of department store in I, I can't remember exactly where some some department store worker I think that's interesting staying with Cadbury but changing from one thing to another I feel like we can see that in a lot of these um people in the past right like you can you can see like a long history of like loyal work with one maybe one employer and it, like over the years um so Sally uh yeah my granddad was working as an airplane engineer my grandma was looking after the house on my dad's side a uh, great aunt who was a farm, farmer on the Isle of Wight with her husband that's yeah that's very interesting we don't hear too much about um the Isle of Wight but that's that's interesting to hear um it's a shame we should hear more about the Isle of Wight we definitely yeah we definitely should I really and I really the Isle of Man as well <laughs> and the Isle of Man yep so Shana Shana sorry if I think I'm saying that right <laughs> uh my great-grandmother was a mental was in a mental asylum in South Wales. Uh, she decided herself to never come out after being admitted for what seems like postnatal depression. Wow, oh. that's a really, um, that's a really sad, sad story for you to uncover. That's um, fascinating that, like, through the institutional records, we can like find find these details out. Um, these hard, like, hardships that our ancestors like got through. That's a really harrowing, a really harrowing find. My heart really goes out to her. Yeah. That's sometimes the case, though. We don't always find jolly things with family history. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, my grandfather was enlisted into the military before the war started. Uh, it was part of the Military Training Act in 1939, uh, which I'd never heard about until my grandfather's military records arrived. No, I haven't heard much about the 1939 Military Training Act either. Nor me, actually. No? You know, <laughs> I was hoping you were going <laughs> to... No, no, I've got like a vague recollection, but not like a, oh yeah, I definitely know what that is. So yeah. I can't really say that I knew anything about it either. Ah, oh, Victoria said she's also got Goddards in her family tree. So maybe, <laughs> maybe we're related somewhere. I think my Goddard side is, um, is Wimbledon and then Surrey. So if there's any uh, common ground there, then let me know. <laughs> I also uh, went to school with a Goddard in Wales. Oh, really? They're yes, they're they're actually they own and run a hotel called the Vinyl Vaur in Bodawithin, and I think one of my relatives got married there. Anyway, but yeah, they're a very well-to-do, um, well-known family in North Wales. Oh, interesting, interesting. I don't, yeah, that doesn't sound like any of my family, but <laughs> good to know. Uh, Crystal, uh, this is really interesting. Uh, my grandfather and his family are travelling showmen. And in 1939, they had a yard, uh, a base of living vans for communities of the fairground. In 1939, they were located at South Cliffs Road uh, living vans at RAF base, Granford Bridge, Lincolnshire. That's pretty wow. cool. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Interesting when we get people that are living not like traditional fixed addresses, but in kind of, yeah, grounds, yards. That's quite a um, unique way of life I think that like traveling with the fair kind of way of life I'd really like to hear more about that crystal actually it was it was either last year or the year before I did an interview um with a an academic whose name unfortunately escaped me but we did it around the world fair um the world's fair and I remember you mentioned that in an earlier comment so I'll see if I can dig out the link for you so you can have a look I don't know if it's going to be of any interest uh but it's a similar sort of subject um so maybe it will be useful we'll see we'll see Let's see. So, Gordon, uh, my dad was a general post office messenger. Uh, my granddad, paternal, was a motor driver, Jensen and Nicholson, at Strat in Stratford, a varnish maker. Uh, my mother was a student. Uh, my grandmother was a bricklayer. 
that was pretty cool. <laughs> all of my um, like female relatives I've found in the 1939 census, I think all of them are listed as home duties. Um, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Varnish making. Yeah, I'm, I've got... I'm not sure whether my, my any of my female relatives are listed as anything other than domestic duties either. Yeah, that's I think I've got a few varnish. I've got like um, on my dad's side, I think it's my great grandfather, and then a few people, maybe his brothers, were um, like furniture makers and furniture varnishers. So you can see how these kind of trades and arts can kind of run in the family a little bit. I just thought of my mother's favourite joke then, and I've already told it once this week, and I can't remember whether it was Daisy, whether you, whether you, whether you were in the meeting, whether I told oh. it. But say again that I was in the meeting. <laughs> your, uh, Daisy, with you, with your um, your um, table making, furniture making ancestors, did any of them ever vanish like an old oak table? Oh wait, that's varnished. That's my mother's favourite joke. <laughs> Sorry, terrible, I isn't it? should have done a little bit more of a laugh than I did it's fine it's actually not that <laughs> it's a terrible joke uh Georgia I think this is interesting as well so my grandfather was a chef on the Great Eastern Railway uh grandmother unpaid domestic duties uh, my mum Joan brother Frank and sister Ada were all at school uh, shortly after this date they were evacuated uh, paternal grandmother worked in a suitcase factory amazing that's really interesting. I wonder what it was like to be a chef on the Great Eastern Railway. That's quite a, that seems like a stressful place to be a chef <laughs> on the train. <laughs> <laughs> but you get to travel every day. Um, I think yeah. that'd be quite fun, actually. What else have we got? So, Gillian, uh, on the 1939 register, my grand's occupation was paid domestic, uh, living in Cheshire at the time. My mum was six years old at the time. Uh, Gran later became a nanny up to the age of 88 years when she finally retired and died a few months after retiring in 1993. Wow. Wow. Jinx. She didn't retire until she was 88. And she worked as a nanny. That's, that's not an easy job to be doing in your 80s, is it? That's Wow. That's very impressive. That is. It is very impressive. What's... So Karen, uh, my great uncle William Strath was living in Bristol, uh, a civil servant, air ministry. He worked for the government um, and after the war wrote the Strath report in 1955 to consider the implications of thermonuclear weapons for the United Kingdom. Always wonder what he did in the war. Wow. So that Strath report was named after him. <laughs> that's, um, that's amazing. That's quite um, significant to have a report like named after him in that way. Karen, you always have such good stories. And just as an aside, and I'm not insinuating anything for your for your uh, great uncle, um, but I have in in the past done little bits of research in the 1939 register looking at spies, and a lot of them do put down civil servant because <laughs> they can't put down that they're a spy. I'm not saying that um, William Strap was a spy. I'm just saying there are instances I've seen of spies putting uh, civil servant down as their occupation. Make that's that really well. interesting <laughs> yeah maybe that's a potential lead I don't know how you would I think that's maybe one of the ones that's it may be impossible to find out if that's true or not if they're a good spy what else have we got here uh should we do one more yeah shall we've already done that one uh yeah Victoria uh in 1939 one great-grandfather was down as a heavy motor driver uh, yet a year later, he was described as an engine driver on his son's wedding certificate. For years, my mother thought her granddad drove trains, but looking at other records over the years, he was described as a carman. So should I presume that he really only drove cars or, or horses and not trains? Uh, he did work for LNW Railway in 1921 and was a stableman and cab cleaner in 1906. Or was he upgraded to train driver as war was imminent? Wow, I, I couldn't tell you, Victoria, but... Um... Maybe he did work his way up. It's entirely, yeah. entirely possible. Yeah, definitely. I think um, you're right, especially the guy, given the context of war. We don't know. Maybe that was a even like quicker promotion as like to meet the needs of the war. We don't know. Uh, but yeah, that's that's really interesting. So I think to make sure we've got enough time for everything that you've got planned, Ellie. I think we'll leave it there for the questions. 
Lovely. Thank you so much, everybody, for your amazing stories. We always, always love to hear them. It's one of the reasons we do Crush the Week, actually, is because we're all re- we at Family Pass, we're really nosy. We want to know about your, your stories and your ancestors and what you've been discovering. Um, we live off it. It's our bread and butter. Um, so, yeah, what we're going to do now is for the last 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey and it's going to be fun. And... <laughs> just forgive me basically so we are going to have a look at our crime collection um i am not for a moment suggesting that you know you've all obviously got criminal ancestors to go and dig out but even even if you don't think you have i really recommend you taking a look at this anyway even if it's just for a a really distant relative or a name you happen to have in your tree it's a really good exercise in using these records because actually they are so so detailed as the case study that I have prepared for you will demonstrate. There are over five million records in this collection published in association with the National Archives of course and cover two and a half centuries I think and my maths is not very good. And you can discover so many things. You can find your ancestor's offence, the sentence, sometimes a physical description, and in some cases, even a photograph. That's like gold dust, right, Daisy? Finding a photo. Yes. Oh, definitely. I think there's no better way to like really bring the history to life, right? To see a photo. It's amazing. Especially Absolutely. if it's a photo of your ancestors getting to try and see, do I look like them? Where can I? <laughs> we got the same nose. <laughs> It's really weird. At one point, um, I think it was in crime records, actually, I came across uh, a record of an overthrow relative, not a direct ancestor. But I looked at this overthrow relative and thought, why do you look like my grandfather? Like, it just in the eyes, they looked, it was the same look. It was very, very bizarre. It's really funny how you can have someone that's like fairly far back in your tree, but there can be a real resemblance where some of the genes can sort of skip generations. You can have a great grandfather that looks exactly like you it's really funny it's spooky and it's funny but it's also science (laughs) (laughs) you can often use these records as well to cross-reference with others such as census records but in particular newspapers for even more detail this collection holds 22 different series from the national archives i've listed them on screen here they've all got their own intricacies i would be here all day if uh, I went into each one of these individually. Um, but um, there is a link that I will pop in the chat if I can find my mouse, which I can't. And if you head to this link, you can see more about each of the individual uh, series that are in this record collection. So yeah, they're not, it's not a comprehensive collection by any means. There are other crime collections to try as well. And as an aside, it might be a good idea if you do decide to fall down the rabbit hole into these records, it's a good idea to briefly research any particular laws that were in place around crime at this time or many, maybe any that were changed or amended. And it really might help you come to terms with any terminology that you find within the records too. And I do also just want to point out that during this case study, I use terms like crime and criminal very loosely because as we will see there are some crimes that might not be considered well maybe still crimes but not quite maybe not quite deserving of the sentence that they were given for said crime um i'm not sure i'm explaining that correctly daisy Do you no you definitely I mean? are 100 percent. i think like with any records, a bit of historical context can help. But I think with these particularly can really help you understand what like a a word or like a sentence or what something, yeah, what one of the rulings actually means is that a bit of research needs to be done because this is some, like there's a lot of things that wouldn't be like somebody wouldn't be like punished for or taken to court for today. But at different times in the past, it's just looked, been very different. <sighs> Exactly. And there's one mantra I want you to all remember while we're doing this little case study, okay? Everything is a clue. I want you to keep that in mind and I want you to take that into all of the research that you're going to do from now on. Everything is a clue. This is an exercise in gleaning as much information as you can from available records and then using each of those little clues that you find from each of those different records to widen your research and build up that bigger picture of that person okay 
So are we ready to have a dive in, Daisy? Yes, we definitely are. Let's go. Awesome. Okay. Oh, I forgot to put these. This is the sort of, sort of things you can find in the records. This is when I forget what slides I've been reading. <laughs> Um, there's lots of stuff that you can find, as we will see. So we are going to have a look at George Ayton, who appears in several records across this collection. In fact, he appears 12 times in the Newgate prison calendar, the quarterly returns and many more besides. So I'm going to go through not quite all of these, but most of them, because with most of them, we can pull out little clues. So. Let's go and have a look. What can we pull out? What can we learn about our George? So he was born, as we can see from the search results, about 1822, 1823. And we're looking at about 1840, 80, 1841 and the London area. OK, so that, that's a good start. So we got here that on the 29th of November, 1841, he appeared at the Central Criminal Court and he was charged with larceny from the person. And I had to go and look up what that meant. Larceny is in effect just theft. And from the person literally means taking something from somebody's person. So not going into their house and stealing a watch. You'd steal the watch right off their wrists. That's like pickpocketing pick would be. OK, exactly. That's a really, why didn't I say, why didn't I think of pickpocketing? I'm missing half of my, my note up there for some reason. I don't know why. Um, he was just 18 years old and he was sentenced to transportation for 10 years. This is not a great start. Um, come on, next slide. Okay, these are some more records to have a look at for him, okay? Um, Basically, what, what we find is that most of these records, I think pretty much all of them, are for the same instance, the same case of when he was charged with larceny at the age of 18. But each of the records, because they're all from different series, they all play a certain part of the bigger puzzle. So we need right. to have a look at all of them. Like, don't discount, don't look at one thinking, oh, that covers one incident look at all of them because each of them are going to offer something slightly different that really does take I guess that just reminds us with like any of this research it just takes patience right you have to remember if there's not a detail on something it could be in something else and if it's not there it could be in something else and there's there's 12 <laughs> 12 versions it's also a really good reminder to look at every little detail of a record that relates to your ancestor so this is three different records here I think from three different series uh, one of them says that uh, he it gives his transportation location um, Van Diemen's Land on the 9th of March apparently and oh, that's later Tasmania so that's that was uh, a penal colony and that was first established I think sometime in 1825 and then that closed I think in 1877 the last one closed mm. so that's the story we've got so far George Ayton convicted of stealing from a person in November 1841 and set to be transported for 10 years to what is now Tasmania. Wow. So that's, that's, that's that feels like a very, I don't know what he stole, but that feels, that's a very harsh punishment, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we'll soon see what he stole. Like, you know, did he steal a watch? Did he, um, et cetera? Some of you might see the clue on screen if I've made it big enough. Um, but as we go on through these different records and through the different series, we get extra pieces of information. So one from Newgate Prison tells me that he was a labourer and with a man called Richard Sullivan stole one handkerchief from an unknown person. A handkerchief. And he got 10 years transportation. Wow. You can't even wrap your head around that, can you? No, you can't. It's, just, it's, it's a completely different time, isn't it? And I think that sounds very harsh. <laughs> yeah, just a bit. Uh, we also see um, George with Richard Sullivan again on the Newgate Prison Register of Prisoners, and it shows me how they were disposed of. OK, so it tells me that Richard went to Stirling Castle at Devonport and George went to Fortitude at Chatham. Now, these are both prison ships. They're prison hulks. So HMS Stirling Castle, HMS Stirling Castle, excuse me, uh, became a prison ship in 1839 and Fortitude became a prison ship in 1833. These are more clues and we get more, more of an example of what's happening in George's story here. 
Um, the next one we've got here as well, uh, am I on the right one here, is the warrant, I think. Yes, it's a warrant, and it details the transfer of all prisoners. Oh, is it the next one? I think it's the next one. Ah, I've got arrows. I forgot about my arrows. Um, is that the right one? Oh, yeah, that was one of the ships. I think this is the Stirling Castle, by the way, I'm forgetting. Oh. Right, this is the warrant, okay? So this is a warrant detailing the transfer of all these prisoners from Newgate Prison to the Fortitude Prison ship that's docked at Chatham. And this is on the 18th of December, 1841, just before Christmas. So we know around this time, based on the date from the trial and the Newgate records, that George has spent around 15 to 20 days in Newgate Prison. Yes, yeah, so I'll just go back there just to just to show you. There you go. George Ayton, almost top of the list. Beautiful handwriting. Yeah. Um, just a little bit on Newgate Prison as well. So it's an old prison. Like this dates back to like the 12th century. And oh, it wow. was built just inside the city of London and was demolished in 1904. And throughout its history, if you look it up at all, you'll see that it was noted several times for its awful conditions. So this is where George went first, and then he went to the Fortitude Prison ship, Dr. Chatton. So a lot to take in. We're learning a lot here. Yeah. Wow. That's really interesting. And I guess also maybe looking at the newspapers will help to give us even more of an insight into like the conditions of prisons at these times. Um, I don't know how much how much we'd find about specific places, but it's definitely worth a little look. Absolutely. If I'd had time, I'd have uh, definitely gone and had a look at that, but I did not. More of a rabbit hole. Um, anyway, okay, next up, we have uh, notes of correspondence, okay? So normally when there's correspondence of, like, petitions or prisoners receiving letters, that would all get recorded. So we've got here on George's behalf from a Mr C. Ayton, of two Batty's Gardens, Backchurch Lane, Commercial Road East. Now, my initial thinking there, Daisy, is that this is his father or a brother or an uncle, perhaps? Yeah. Yes, that would make sense, wouldn't it? I guess... I quite... Sorry, yeah, sorry. No, go for it. <laughs> I was just going to say, I cut this off right at the top of the document, because this is all in a list of, of correspondence. There's the word refusal. So I'm wondering whether this refers to a petition and that the petition was refused. That would be my initial suspicion. Yeah, that yeah, that makes sense. I think that's what I would guess, too. Yeah, so much, so much. Um, OK, let's move on, shall we? Um, this next one tells us another clue. It says so he's in the middle and it says George Ayton, uh, 10 years twice before in prison now of all the records that we've looked at so far this is the first instance we learn that this is not george's first offense has been in prison before um okay and i think i've got one more crime record i wanted to show you and this is the real jackpot okay look at this this is amazing this is the petition of christopher ayton of number two, Batty's Gardens, Back Church Lane, Commercial Road East in the county of Middlesex, Butcher, that's his occupation. It's a petition written on behalf, not by, but on behalf of Christopher Ayton, but probably by a solicitor or maybe a friend, perhaps, um, to the Secretary of State for the Home Department, Sir James Graham. This is so, so detailed. I get I learned so much more about this case from this one petition letter. It's incredible. And also it helps oh. that the handwriting is actually really quite straightforward to read. Yeah. So the key things I took out of this letter were it confirms that George is Christopher's son. It tell it shows the anguish that Christopher has the anguish and the anger at these court proceedings so I get the impression that the court hearing the trial didn't quite go as it should have done so there should apparently have been witnesses to give a character okay. as in a character witness for George and for Richard but the police officer who gave evidence against them who had arrested them for stealing the handkerchief uh, had apparently stated during the trial that there were no witnesses present oh. 
And the petition goes on to state that George Baker received money for appearing as a witness. And if the witnesses, for so the character witnesses, had been called, um, a very different sentence would have been passed, so says this petition. Even more, it goes on to say that George Baker displayed improper conduct and deceived the court. And in fact, on the 3rd of December, 1841, George Baker was dismissed from his role as a police constable by the City Police Commission. Wow. Does it give the reason... So I was going to say, did, did they give the reason that he was dismissed in this in this petition? Not in the petition, no. Other than oh. the instances of him saying that there were no witnesses when there were and some exchange of money, I didn't really get any more clues yeah. other than that. But there's more to come. So while this is a really, really heartbreaking read, and I picture Christopher sitting down with his solicitor or his friend and recounting all of this, you know, it says things like, your petitioner's son is only 18 years of age and up until a very recent period conducted himself with the strict with strict propriety and, and as a very well disposed youth. It goes on to say that George is George's sentence of 10 years transportation should be commuted and asks for mercy to be shown um, because of all the pain and anxiety that a parent can feel for the misery and disgrace of his unfortunate son. That is a direct quote from this petition it absolutely tugs at the heart wow. and then what you can see on the right hand side as well you can see a long list of people who signed this petition along with their addresses and if i had had time i'd have looked at every single one of these but i didn't have time Boo. wow maybe that's i don't know if you have the link to this ellie but maybe that's one that we can send into the send into the chat and you guys can have a little <laughs> I'll have, I'll have to dig it out for you once we finish. Or something. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, so I also included these from the same letters. Um, so there's there's a sort of the, the bit where it's addressed that's actually really hard to read. I really struggled with that. And there's also a, an additional um, letter, which I think is... I think he's written by a chap called William Nutter. I, I can't read his handwriting very well, but... Um, it goes on to say that this this chap has said that he states that Christopher Rayton, he's known him for 19 years, during the whole of which time he has maintained the character of a respectable and honest man. And it really feels that the whole community got behind Christopher and the family to get George home. So would anybody like to know how the story ends? I definitely would. <laughs> you definitely yeah. would. I mean, yeah, of course. Be before we do that, I wanted to go and have a look at the family in the 1841 census. The 1841 census took place obviously in 1841, which was the year that George uh, was tried for this offence. But obviously, that happened later, later yeah. in the year. So, pre earlier on in the year, we find Christopher Ayton, who is a butcher at the exact same address that he mentions, uh, Batty's Gardens. His wife was Margaret. They have six other children. They are all under 18. So I suspect that George may have been the eldest, if, if not just one of the eldest. OK, George isn't in the household. Where is he? <laughs> so pre-census, uh, sorry, pre his trial and his crime and his sentence he's not in the census well he's not with his family anyway right. I do just want to point out as well that um by 1851 uh Christopher and Margaret are at uh let me just flick over to the next slide they are at uh, Providence Street um no George again so where do okay. we think George is where do we think he is So how old would he have been at this time? That's just he would have been about eighteen, and it's it was really, uh, just before. Yeah, so about six months. I think it's six months before his his offence. Where do we think he was, if not with his family? So it, got lots of suggestions coming in the comments. Game. Prison. Um, what else? Any other guesses? <laughs> Liam said Dundee. 
<laughs> You'd be surprised because actually I saw quite a quite a few people being sent to prisons in Dundee. Anyway, 1841 census, we find George Ayton at a correction facility. It's known as the House of Correction in Clerkenwell. Now, this is either the Clerkenwell prison, which happens to be just around the corner from our London office, like literally just around the corner, or it's the Cold Bath Field prison. I didn't have time to go and look into which one exactly this was, but it's one or the other. And I just put this little image of um, Cold Bath Field prison in there. So... We've got him in the 1841 census before his uh, before his trial at a correction facility, which sort of fits in with what we know from one of the records that when he was sent to Newgate and then the prison hulk in late 1841, this wasn't his first offence. I don't know why I keep doing air quotes. I just feel really sorry for this man. OK. Yeah. Um, so that's where he is in 1841 and he doesn't appear in the 1851 census. So what does that tell you? What do we think? What do we think? I'm, I, I, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to have to. I'm just going to have to plow on. <laughs> there he is at the bottom, by the way. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, as it happens, it appears that Christopher's attempts to have his son's sentence commuted failed. I'm yeah. really sad to report this. Um, George was indeed transported to what is now Tasmania. We have this very detailed record of his arrival. It was oh, wow. uh, the 11th of August, 1842, aboard the Surrey that departed London on the 5th of April, 1842. It says that he's Protestant and he can neither read or write. His trade is a butcher. Um, whether he was, you know, one of the things, one of the other records said that he was a labourer, but this fits in with what hit the, the trade of his father. It gives quite a detailed physical description it says he has a fresh complexion brown hair black eyebrows black, black eyes was it brown eyes it was one of the other i think it might have been brown eyes um he appears to have moles and marks on his neck it gives one of his earlier convictions which is some sort of misconduct for concealing something in a cookhouse i couldn't right. quite read it very well um but if anybody else wants to go and have a gander at this it's quite easy to find in the tasmania convict registers um so, yes. And there was, I think, another conviction that, that is noted on here for, I think it's 1847, I think, or 1845. He was he was basically told to go out and work and he didn't go out and work. And he also seemed to have a pair of new boots in his possession. So he got four months on the working on the roads for that. Right. Um. And I think somebody else has found this already. I'm just going to scroll up in the comments because I think I saw somebody mention it. Oh, no. Yes, yes, yes. OK. Um, I think it was Karen. OK, so um, in 1851, George Ayton, age 27, married Margaret Lowe. She was 17 and they married in Tasmania. And by this point, George is a brewer. And I wasn't sure whether this was him or not, but I've included it anyway. Um, there's a death record in 1886, which matches his birth year, but, but this is for a Richard George Ayton, a farmer who died of bronchitis. It could be him. I didn't quite have enough time to, um, to go into it further. I'm massively running out of time, but there is one more thing I wanted to show you, everybody. I'm so sorry, and then I'll let you go. Did I find any mention of this case in the newspapers, Daisy? What do you think? If I had to guess, I'd guess that you maybe found something. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be right. I think we can find anything if we do enough digging. <laughs> Absolutely. So this this article, which was from the Morning Herald and actually appeared in several other London newspapers, it's mainly to do with George Baker's misconduct, but it's more detailed for the story overall. So this is the key. This is the, these are the key points I pulled out um, from. George Baker's hearing at the Guildhall in front of an alderman. So he couldn't name or find or produce the man that George Ayton and Richard Sullivan stole the handkerchief from. He accepted liquor and money, half a crown, from Christopher Ayton to, at the trial, at George Ayton's trial, to 
speak favourably so that George Ayton would have a lesser sentence. However, right. what happened, from what I can deduce from this article, is that Christopher was barred from entering the Old Bailey, where the trial was taking place. He was barred from coming in. When the trial was over, George Baker comes out. Christopher's going, what's happened? Um, George Baker says, oh, he's got 10 years transportation, mate. Then the mother, Margaret, she absolutely breaks down to, into hysterics. Um, and, yeah, it's very, very sad. And then during, the, during this hearing at the, at the Guildhall for, for George Baker into his misconduct, he was asked, why didn't you tell the judge at the time that Christopher was outside? And he said he did. And then somebody else, I think another police officer said, no, you didn't. And then apparently after George Ayton's trial, when George Baker comes out to see Christopher and, and Margaret, um, while Margaret broke down into hysterics, George Baker made off. He basically just ran away so he didn't have to deal with it. Mm. And... Before the trial, sorry, this is a lot of information. I'm just trying to, trying to remember this all in my head. Before the trial, George Baker had apparently suggested to Christopher to, um, sorry, this was after the trial, after the trial, he'd suggested to Christopher, hey, why don't you do a petition to try and get the sentence commuted? And quite rightly, Christopher turned around to George Baker and said, I want nothing more to do with you. I will do this on my own. And I will also make sure that you are taken to task for what you've done today. The alderman, last, last thing, alderman's closing remarks at George Baker's hearing were, what business had you to even be drinking at the expense of the poor prisoner's friends and making associates of them? You are the last man who should remain in the force a day longer. Wow. What an amazing find, Ellie. I really wow. enjoyed digging into that. I am not going to lie. I really yeah. enjoyed this story. It absolutely broke my heart but you know because George Ayton was separated from his family they probably never saw each other again but from what I can tell George at least made a life for himself in Tasmania he married he had children thank you Karen for sharing those links um that he had children as well um yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, th to think all that all that's happened to him aged only 18 is um is really crazy but like you say like it's good to see that he was able to make a make a life for himself i know wow. so what was the mantra that i said right at the beginning of that story everything's a, everything's a clear wait was it you, i don't know if you're asking everybody <laughs> and I yeah, just yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> anybody everything is a clue and i hope that this case study has just proved that for you don't discount some of the crime records just because you think oh but that's that's the same offense that I've already looked at in another record um you're you're going to find a new normally you'll normally find an extra clue in everything and always when you've got an image rip it to pieces okay take everything Tran you know if and something's not been transcribed try doing it yourself um it's sometimes quite difficult, but you can always send it um, to somebody else in the community to have a look at. We'll have a look at it for you if you want us to. We love <laughs> stuff like this. Um, I think that's the end of today. So apologies for running over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's everything that we everything that we had for you, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, um, so what do we think, Daisy? Um, are we going to come back? Are you going to come back and do Friday's Live again at some point? yeah I think I will I think I'll do it this hasn't been um yeah I've really enjoyed this this has been really interesting so I think maybe next time I'll come back and maybe I'll do a full a full session myself this is a nice little this is easing me in share it you know helping Ellie today but um yeah thank you everybody you've been um <laughs> you've been very kind so you haven't scared me away <laughs> <laughs> fantastic everybody you've shared such 
uh, insightful and thoughtful uh, comments and questions and stories this week. So thank you so much. Look, you've got some 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 praise coming into the comments for you, Daisy, there as well. Um, we do this every week, four o'clock UK time on a Friday. Come back and join us next week. And if you want us to, me and Jessamy, to try and tackle your brick wall, head to our Facebook page. There is a post there that I think I posted yesterday, Thursday, 30th of March. Go and add your brick wall to there and we'll see if we can tackle it for you in April. And we hope you have a lovely weekend. Great. Yeah. Have a lovely weekend, everybody. Speak to you soon. Take care.